amenable to a, a variable number of properties and temporal properties in particular. And this is a technique called model checking that's particularly good at doing this sort of thing. Okay? So I'll give you a very quick introduction to model checking as we go along in this talk. So the idea at a high level for model checking or any other verification system is we need to somehow extract a model of the program. We capture the behavior of the program. We write down a property that you care about. And then we'd like to ideally automatically check whether the system exhibits that property. Okay. So let's look at generating the model of the source in the first place. There's an easy way to generate a model of the source, which is just take a control flow graph. Right? We'd like to reduce programs to state machines because that's how model checking works. Easy. Control flow graph gives us a basic state machine. What would a model of orbits look like? Well, I don't know because I don't have access to the orbit source. And after this talk, they should me aren't going to give me access to that. <laughs> but I can guess what it is based on my knowledge about how web-based systems work. And it's going to be something like this at a high level. Display a list of hotels. Set a variable saying which one the user chose. Display, what, display the details. Use the chosen to compute the reserved hotel. Display the reservation, and so on. Here's an interesting thing. If I take this state machine, a little more detailed version of this, and I feed it to my model checker and give it the property that I explained to you before, the model checker comes back and says, this program is fine. There's no error. Why would it do that? Because there's at least one edge missing in the state machine, which is the ability to go back to that previous window and open a new window. Okay. It's the ability to come here, look at the one that was displayed, and say, oh, wait a minute, maybe I'd like to look at some other hotels as well. And concurrently start off essentially another thread of execution for the different hotel. And now you create the potential for confusion. So clearly, there's more to the control flow graph of a web program than simply what we get by generating the control flow graph of a web program. Okay? So we need to think about this a bit. So the back button, for instance, introduces new control flow. Cloning introduces new control flow, and so on. So how many browser, how many operations are there in today's browsers? Well, so you know, here's just the operations in you know Microsoft Internet Explorer. Actually, there's a few more, and uh, there's even more, right? That's just one browser, and all of these operations introduce some subtlety or the other in the control flow. How are we going to model all of the browsers in existence? Well, we can't, right? Because browser writers can be arbitrarily clever or arbitrarily nasty if you're the author of the website. But um, one of the things that we've done in the past few years, and this is work actually with Matthew, Matthias and Ravi, is to find a calculus so we can reduce this big myriad of web interaction operations to two simple primitives. Dan, here you go, web interaction on one slide, right? OK, I can even write it on index card if you want. Okay? So there are two operations. We submit and switch. Okay? Submit is what you would expect. It's the thing that's already in the control flow graph. It says, go to the next point in the, in the program source. Switch lets you go back to any previous web interaction. It's essentially a non-deterministic choice, and it's how we model all the, abil all the operations that current browsers give you. And these two primitives turn out to be powerful enough for pretty much all the browsers in existence today. So starting off with this control flow graph that you could generate in your compiler's course, the web control flow graph actually looks like this. OK? So that's how we start. That's how we get the control flow graph. Now I need to tell you something about writing properties. Now the most important thing to remember about the properties is we want to say something about a web page. Web pages are ugly, right? What I'm saying is when I talk about the hotel, right, it's easy to identify the hotel in the output. It's, it's the thing over there. But the hotel and the source is some random HTML. How do I even refer to it? How do I index it? So the obvious things are really bad ideas. Parsing HTML is a nightmare. Okay? And static distance coordinates are way too brittle because people are going to keep changing the layout of pages. So what do you do? So we have a very simple engineering solution that any d developer for the web would be able to understand. And that solution is to say, look, if you want to display this item, chances are you're going to want to format it in some way. Okay? That's exactly what cascading style sheets let you do. Cascading style sheets let you put a little tag on each item in the web page so that you can go back and later on put some formatting around it. So for the web developer, we say, if you want to refer to some element on a web page, all you need to do is to add a CSS tag. And that's something any web developer understands. And voila. 
We've gotten off the ground. We can finally start writing properties. So now we can refer to atomic pieces of pages. We still need to talk about the behaviors. So, um, well, this just says what I said. What we're going to do is annotate each state in the control flow graph with the tags that were put on that state. Okay? This is how we can start thinking about the program, the control flow graph, as generating a trace of these tags. The properties themselves are written as automata. This is traditional model checking. This is how it works. You write it as an automaton. So for example, if you want to say you have to go through a password entry page, otherwise you don't get access to the site, you might have some start, start node over here. You can go to node two. If you don't see the password entry tag, you get to the access control part of the site, you're now in violation, and you can report this as a failure of the system. Okay? So these are simple automata. Actually, they get a little uglier because, um, oh, where are my automata? Hmm, I don't have them. I'm sorry. I edited the talk at the last minute. Anyway, I have, so there, the point is, th this is, this is what we do. We write our properties as little automata. The automata express the temporal sequences of behavior that we're willing to permit. Okay? And they can get a little ugly, and so we've built these into the system. So there's a, there's a library, of co a combinatorial library, if you will, of automata that you can use for stating most of your properties. So now I need to tell you something about how model checking actually works. Step three, how do we do the check automatically? We use an idea that's one of the great ideas, I think, of computer science. It's due to Moshe Vardy and Pierre Wolper. It says the following. The web control flow graph describes a set of traces, right? You can just think of all the infinite runs of this control flow graph. It's a set of strings, right? These are the behaviors that can potentially happen if you run this program. What do the automata describe? The automata describe the set of behaviors that are permissible of the program. This is all we're willing to let the program do. So what we have done is reduce this big verification question to a very simple question which is we want the language of the first automaton to be contained within the language of the second automaton. Okay? This is called language containment style model checking. I think it's one of the really beautiful ideas that you can take this big complicated problem and reduce it to this very simple primitive that we've known since the 1950s. So that's the style of model checking we're doing in this talk. So this is the Orbitz web control flow graph. And we take this orbits control flow graph, we verify this against the property, and sure enough, it comes back and reports the violation that we expected. Right? It says you can go here, you can go back, you can go through this again, and now you get a violation. It gives you some more errors. Okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a model checker, so it'll actually give you a, a trace of the system and show you the steps that happened. It's wonderful, by the way. It's, in fact, even more wonderful because it gives you more error reports than we knew were there. Okay? For example, it gives us the following error report. It says, start the because as I said, it gives you a trace. So the trace says, start the system, click on the forward button. You can't do that, right? You can't go forward until you've gone back. Well, but I've got all these forward edges over here. That's perfectly legitimate as far as this control flow graph is concerned. So this control flow graph actually is a bit of a fake. It's got edges in there that aren't really there in the program at all because these edges are kind of phantom edges. They're not there until I've done something that puts the edges in there. So I have two choices. One choice is to explode the size of the state machine to consider all of the possible forward and backward combinations. Now, if you know something about model checking, you know that the big problem in model checking is keeping the state space small enough that we can tractably do verification. In fact, just fitting the thing into memory is often a major problem. Okay? So a factorial size blow up of the state machine isn't going to do us any good at all. Right? That's, that's not going to solve any problems. Fortunately, we found another clever idea. So this talk is all about other people's clever ideas. We found another clever idea in the literature, which was um, from the people at UMass Amherst, which is to use something called constraint automata. These constraint automata basically say that a path is feasible until the constraint automaton goes off. And it says at that point, this path is no longer feasible. You can now get rid of it from reporting any errors. So we essentially stole this algorithm from flavors. The constraints in our case are very simple. In fact, they're automatically generated, right? Because we know where all of the forward edges are statically by generating them. So all we need to do now is insert the constraint saying, these aren't really there until they're eventually there. Okay? So it's a little complicated to generate these, but the beauty of it is they generate it automatically. The developer doesn't have to do it. It's all built in for you. 
So what's the status of this work? We've been applying this to a non-trivial web application called Continue. Um, I think one of the things that's truly appalling about the state of computer science is the state of conference management software. Right? If anything is mission critical for us, it's conferences. Right? And every, I've heard people say over and over again, we would love to do a better job on this, but there's no research there. Okay? So I only have about four papers on this topic so far and more in the pipeline because it's a fascinating problem. There are control problems, there are data problems, there are verification questions, there are database access questions, there are persistence problems, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? If you're looking for problems, look simple. Don't try to get too complicated. So we've actually implemented the system called Continue. It's even been used by third parties. So non-schemers have used this. Okay? Non-schemers are running scheme on the web. What more could you want? And um, we're, we're in the process of verifying Continue. We've done a bunch of optimizations. So far, we haven't found any problems, but that's because the problems we found helped us to generate the properties in the first place. We use uh, set-based analysis for actually generating control flow graph and propagating stuff, and that's due to some other clever people, some of whom are here. Um, now, there's actually an interesting point here. There's a reason I gave this talk over here uh, for Dan. Um, it's written in Scheme, and we use Send Suspend, which is this continuation-based interaction primitive. Now, how many of you have built a program analysis in this room? Great. OK. What do you do when you get to input-output? You punt. Make very conservative assumptions. You make very conservative assumptions. Basically, you assume nothing. Okay. Now, let's look at a typical web program. Here's a simple web program that reads two numbers and prints their sum. Okay. This is as obvious as code can get, right? Read a number from the web, call it n1. Read another number from the web, call it n2, and print the sum. This isn't a web program. Well, it's a web program for us schemers. But in the real world, it turns into all of this code, which is separated into three chunks, with all of the following dependencies between them. If you wanted to generate, if you wanted to analyze that program, you need to be able to handle hidden fields, you need to be able to handle potentially database accesses, your data is being marshaled out, marshaled back in. All of that becomes the responsibility of the analysis, Jerry. Is that because the, state, the, the web is stateless? That's because the web is stateless. Uh, you're, you're trying to map a stateful so protocol. So we really have a problem with map modeling persistent flow of the state. Is, it turns out to be more complicated than that. Um, it's persistent local and non-local state. Okay. Yes, uh, but we'll talk about that more if you want. I'm sorry? That's, that, yeah, I think that's actually orthogonal. But anyway, the point is, that's what your, all of those black arrows become the responsibility of your program analysis. And we have it on the authority of no less than Dr. Shivers himself that he punts. He makes conservative assumptions, which means he wouldn't be able to do anything with this program. This is the program that I get to write, right? Because I've got continuations. So the structure of the code matters greatly. Web programs are splintered. So program analysis must reconstruct the program on the left from the program on the right. Okay? Continuation programming gives us gives this for free. So here's something really great, right? We've always known that continuations make program analysis really hard. I'm here to tell you continuations make program analysis really easy. If you just find the right domain. Squint hard and it's right there in front of you. So to put this in perspective, the work I've described here encompasses traditional verification. We can do all the standard things that model checkers do, but in addition, we can take into account these interesting control-based behaviors that are introduced by model checkers. Secondly, continuations are good. Dan, I, you should be smiling broader than that, harder than that. And finally, um, there's actually, for those of you who are interested in verification, there's some very interesting subtle stuff going on here. If, you're, you, if you have experience in verification, you might say, well, look, all you're trying to do is to model the environment, right? Those clicks are just the user environment. So we always know in model checking, you have to write something called an environment model that says how the environment behaves. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is in traditional verification, the environment model is something that composes in parallel. It says the program is capable of all sorts of wacko behaviors. The environment's capable of all sorts of wacko behaviors. For example, a packet might be sent and never get received infinitely long, forever, right? The, pa the channel just goes down. And you're not interested in verifying against those extreme behaviors, maybe because there's something else in the protocol that lets you guarantee those won't happen. So you add on these environment models that constrain the system to the reasonable cases that you're interested in. It's parallel composition 
Parallel composition reduces the set of possible behaviors. What we're doing here is sequential composition. We're extending the set of behaviors. We're saying there are things the program could never do based on its source. Right? Nobody in the source program of a web pro nobody in the source of a web application says, and here the user clicks the back button. Right? It's not there. So we are extending the set of behaviors, not constraining it. So this is completely different from a traditional environment model for verification. So that's the end of my talk, and I'd be happy to take questions. John. Well, I want to talk a little bit about Orbis because I was the lead software architect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not feeling it. Uh, you used to call it an Orbis problem. <laughs> so, the lead architect. Uh, in fact, uh, the behavior that you found, uh, we were completely aware of it, and it was a business decision to let it work that way. And the reason. Uh, just hold on, hold on, I'd like to hear this. Here's why it was a business decision, is because um, the hotel stuff, every time you say, oh, what about this room, what about that room, we have to go back to the mainframe systems, and these are systems that were designed in the early 80s, and ask, is this data still valid, to find out if, the, if, that reserve, if we can still get a room at those prices in those, in those properties. And every time we go back to the mainframe, it costs money. So, yeah, you can go back when you go to another room. Okay. Which I was say, you could have easily saved some state. I think, I think that's bogus. I think that's bogus. You're missing a separation of concerns. Okay? <laughs> The separation of concerns is between knowing which hotel the person wanted and knowing whether the hotel room's price is up to date, right? So what you guys did is you conflated both of those. What you should have done is to say this is the hotel, but when you click submit, it's not guaranteed that the price that you got that is listed here is available or even that a room is available. And Absolutely. those are the two constraints. That's, yeah. that's the way we could have done it, and that was yeah. the way we wanted to do it. And the business guy said, no, don't do that. Okay. No. Yeah. So, a separation his, of another separation of concerns. His, his answer is way too weak for you. Let's, do, let's take a glass off. <laughs> 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 if, if, you were, if, if you were the only company that had that problem, and you be there, I completely buy this. This is not the case. As Shura mentioned a couple of times at the beginning of this talk, I sent my son to the wrong city in Europe by accident. He was a minor. I bought, he, he really but he's Matthias' son, so you know you probably don't have to worry too much. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, renewed, he, renewed, he renewed our websites for the wrong number of years. It's persistent. It's pervasive. It's pervasive not because of mainframes. It's pervasive because the Java technology that, and, and, and the yeah, I, technology, the Java technology that took I, over there, excuse me. <laughs> 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 Guy is one of us for the weekend, so it's okay. okay. Yeah. It's fundamentally flawed. It's fundamentally flawed. In fact, Java, 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 in fact, here's a moral for people listening in, right? So Java servlets are fundamentally broken because they push websites into making the wrong implementation decision, right? Java servlets, what do Java servlets give you that's really easy to use? They give you a notion of session state. Session state leads exactly to the orbits problem. Okay, so Java servlets push developers towards making websites that are buggy because they give you one and no, there's two kinds of information flow on the web. They give you one really easily, the other really poorly. John, last sentence in defense. You're right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but he knew you were right. Well, no, uh, that's right. Guy? I'm not terribly familiar with the hotel reservation system in Harvard, so I haven't used that much, but I know that on flights, after you select the wrong flight, it does give you another page that says, are you sure? Yeah. Shame on you for not checking that. Right. Because why would you trust a web page? That's right. Yeah. So imagine now, given your broken web program. Can you start again, please? Okay, imagine now with something like Orbitz that you corrected it by storing a hidden field in your, sure. in your hotel page, which hotel was picked, so we'll do the right one. Would your system, so that now there's this variable that my system would handle that just fine. Okay, even yeah. though there's a variable and you could have an arbitrary. Number I don't because I don't have hidden fields. What you call a hidden field for me is just a lexically scoped variable, a left-bound variable. 
That's exactly why I don't have to worry about it. Okay, but I mean, would would your system be able to verify? You know, if you open several windows of different values yes. of the variable, and then pick. that's exactly what it's designed. It's designed to handle exactly those cases. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, Jerry, you, sir. Yes. Oh no, I was thinking of the fact that this indicates it's easy for very smart people to make things that are so complicated they can't understand. No, it, it goes back to your very first remark. It goes back, and I, let me let me refine what I said to John. It goes back to Jerry's very first remark. Programmers to this day do not understand the first lesson in 3.11. Sorry, it was good. when I was young, it was called 3.11. There are stores and there are environments. Yep. And that's a fundamentally flawed understanding. And that's what Jerry was saying when he said global storage, you know, global storage. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Jim, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I don't know. This seems like a. Uh, a, a, a validation of Minsky's position rather than yours, Jerry. Right? Computer, computer program, computers are a wonderful device to allow people to build things that they don't understand. That's all true. <laughs> <laughs> or know how to use. <laughs> Thank you.